Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, you'll have to forgive me. I'm a I um lost my voice earlier this week, so I'm just a little froggy like. Um, but <clears throat> I'm so thankful to be here with you all. My name is Crystal, and um I teach at Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary. So I teach Christian students who are seeking to get ordained to be ministers, chaplains, um, and that type of similar work. And um, my background is largely in interfaith relations, but especially Christian Muslim relations in my research and um, in my community work. And the past six months, I would say that I have had um, the privilege to work alongside a lot of Muslims, but also a lot of Jewish friends um, in working for Palestine and for Gaza, especially right now. Uh, so I, I just want to give, you know, thanks for that opportunity because it's what I have studied so much, and it's it's an opportunity to put it into practice. Unfortunately, it's during this time. Um, that the genocide in Gaza that has brought us together, um, but it has produced a lot of very beautiful interfaith solidarity work that um, I'm thankful that that people are are putting their their faith commitments into practice to support one another and to support the oppressed. So um, I, I did want to share that. Um, I spent time in Bethlehem uh, last week for about five days, and I did not leave Bethlehem when I was there. So I just wanted to share a little bit about those experiences, um, and I'll be watching the chat. So if any questions come up while I'm speaking, um, please feel free. Um, I think one thing that has struck me during this genocide and struck me when I was in um, Belen, in Bethlehem, is that um, Palestinians are asking, but not just now, have been asking, uh, tell our story. And so the conference that I attended uh, was largely Christians. It's called Christ at the Checkpoint. And this has been part of the work of Palestinian theologian and Lutheran minister Munther Isak, who uh, wrote a book um, from some of the past conferences. My understanding is um, past conferences, which I have not attended, we're focused on helping Christian Zionists to learn the Palestinian story. And if you're not familiar with Christian Zionism, just roughly, it's Christians all over the world, but especially in the U.S., are very influential um, in having power over foreign policy, but also financial power in sending, helping send people to live um, and displaced Palestinians, so in occupied territories and displaced Palestinians. So they fund settlements, among other things. Uh, Christian Zionists have different beliefs, but I would say that most of them have a shared belief that Israel, uh, the modern state, has some sort of role to play in the second coming of Jesus, the return of Jesus. So it's uh, definitely a misguided belief that not all Christians share, but definitely something that wields a lot of power in U.S. politics and foreign policy, especially Christians United for Israel. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, um, you can go to their website and learn more about it if you are uh, prepared <laughs> to look at that material, because it is, it is pretty daunting because that Christian narrative also supports violence in the region. The pastor and founder of Christians United for Israel, John Hagee, has said in the past that anyone who tries to work for peace in the region is violating scripture and that violence is necessary because his interpretation of the scriptures is that violence is necessary in order to bring Jesus back in the region of Israel-Palestine. So he believes that Brokers for peace, peace negotiations, um, any return of land to the Palestinians is a violation of scripture. So this ideology really fuels a lot of the beliefs, even of a lot of our lawmakers, even if they're not 100% in line um, or in alignment with the beliefs of Christians United for Israel, in practice, uh, their politics is very much in line with these beliefs.
So uh, the conference has constantly or consistently aimed to try and address Christian Zionism because of how much power that it wields. So I think that's just some background on that. You can also find, um, I can put his name in the chat, Munther Isaac Sermons. Um, he's at Bethlehem Bible College. If you ever, if, if you're not familiar, many people are because he's been on Al Jazeera and Democracy Now! Um, in the past six months, almost seven of this genocide. Um, but I do want to go back to Palestinians, including those at this conference, saying, please tell people our story. And as you all know, this is something, this is a refrain that Palestinians have had long before October 7th, right? Is tell people our story and tell the truth about what is happening here. And that is a theme that I've been hearing, I feel like, from God, from Palestinians, these past six months, but before these past six months was to tell the truth. And it has been controversial, not just these past six months, but before to say Palestinians live under occupation. Palestinians have been experiencing ethnic cleansing. It has been controversial. And so there has been pushback and there has been a, a reticence for those of us from various religious communities and non-religious to speak about Palestine for fear of offending people. And so Palestinians living in Bethlehem and other places are saying, please, please just tell the truth. And so I, I, I hear this as I think about what the Quran says about telling the truth, about what the Christian scriptures say about telling the truth, and what the oppressed have to say about telling the truth. They have no reason to lie. Um, Palestinians have been under brutal occupation. And this is a, a thing I testified to from the various people I met in Bethlehem in my short time there, from shopkeepers to people in coffee shops, to taxi drivers, uh, my driver to and from the airport, uh, people who live in Palestine, no matter where they live, whether they're from Jerusalem and have sort of more privileges in Israeli society, or they're from the West Bank, uh, whether they're from Al Khalil, Hebron, they have the same testimonies. And what are those testimonies uh, of occupation? So of checkpoints, of being brutalized and tormented at checkpoints. So I will give an example. Uh, one man I met, he came to the U.S. on scholarship uh, years ago, received his bachelor's and his master's in international relations, international law. He now works in Palestine for the government, and he cannot get paid regularly because Israel withholds funds from the government of Palestine especially since October 7th, they withhold all the funds that they're required to give through agreements. Um, and so Palestinian employees that are employed by the government of Palestine will have their salary withheld for months at a time, or they will, when they're paid, they're given only a portion because the money isn't there. So even someone who has multiple degrees and is working is unable to hardly provide for his family. He expressed to me his fear of not being able to afford diapers, formula for his young child, that um, there's just constantly every day, um, this realization every time they wake up, how are we gonna afford to pay for our living expenses? The other thing that he shared was the fear of checkpoints. Uh, he and colleagues, both male and female, that's important, um, when they leave Bethlehem, they want to go to Ramallah, and they have to go through checkpoints. It takes significantly longer to get to work because of the checkpoints, but also because of what happens at these checkpoints. One example he gave is that him and his colleagues, sometimes they stay the night in Ramallah, and he said it's not because we don't want to be with our families, but it's because we want to avoid... Um, as many opportunities to go through the checkpoints as possible. So they had their suitcases and the Israeli soldiers poured out their clothes when they stopped them at the checkpoint onto the ground. 
and they took the woman's um, underwear, her private clothing, and were parading it to humiliate her in front of her male colleagues. And he, he looked at me and he said, I need you to understand, this is not rare. This is not unique to me and to my colleagues. This is every day, all the time for Palestinians across Palestine and the occupied territories. This is life all the time. And I think that's the truth of the matter that we haven't been able to speak about or we've been too timid or afraid to speak about prior to October 7th, which is in part why we are in such a dire situation in trying to tell the truth. Uh, people are trying to suppress the truth. People will say that the truth is anti-Semitic even when there's countless Jewish voices testifying to the same reality for Palestinians. So I think it's important that we share the truth. Um, and that's just this one man's story. Another part that is consistent of the stories of people I met who are all strangers to one another, right? So they're all strangers, but they have the same experiences with occupation. And that is of men being detained for, for unjust causes, for no reason, young men, including children under 18. Um, this man that I met, his brother was detained from the ages of 17 to 20 for no reason. Um, th sometimes their claim is they were throwing a rock or, you know, they upset a soldier. And, and one thing that they said is sometimes soldiers, just depending on their mood, will mistreat people, will make it more difficult for them at a checkpoint will detain them. So the other thing people are terrified of that happens regularly are raids. The soldiers will come through, make announcements, threaten people, go into their homes and claim that they are looking for terrorists when there is no such terrorists anywhere. There's just people trying to live their lives and they live in fear because they hear the soldiers coming down the road and entering people's homes, raiding their homes. So that's one aspect of life that, again, is not rare, and it's not unique to certain people, um, people I met. It's a common theme. And and the other thing is that's in Bethlehem. Uh, the other part of life is for people who live outside of Bethlehem, for example, in Hebron, where there are settlers. And I had the opportunity, was going to have the opportunity to visit a friend who is working with the International Solidarity Committee. I was unable to make my ride and didn't get to go, but she came to see me. So what I wanted to do is share a little about what she testifies to. She's been there a month. And uh, she said to me, what I want to share with you is part of the Palestinian story of survival of this oppression is that there are Palestinian farmers uh, across the West Bank who every day have to survive occupation. Settlers have been given weapons since October 7th. So they walk around this. I witnessed with my own eyes as well. Kids, people of all ages, men, women with big guns, just walking around them. Like if it's a backpack, um, and the settlers go to the homes, the land of Palestinians. In the case of my friend who is there, um, she said someone came into the home and smashed all the electronics and set the car on fire, the family's car on fire. Uh, they've stolen goats, which is a major source of income for families uh, from the goat for its meat, from the milk it produces, where they make a number of products like the goat milk, yogurt. So stealing or losing a goat, having a goat stolen is, is a big deal economically, aside from having your home interior demolished, your car set on fire, your land set on fire. Land is often set on fire. And in um, the instance very recently for my friend is that there is a settler, someone who moved from Texas with his pickup truck and she said that he drives every day to different Palestinian families, farms, their land, and spends his day harassing them. He spends his day, 
yelling at them, racist slurs, taunting them, intimidating them. And so that's the purpose, right, of the International Solidarity Committee is, is to bring people from all over the world to testify, document what's happening. Their presence sometimes lessens the violence of the Israeli soldiers uh, and the settlers. So, so she is there with other people from other places in the world. They're recruiting people to go. Um, but I met with her and one of her her friends that is there with her, and and it's painful. It's painful for them to watch this and feel um, that there is only so much they can do to help these families who are being brutalized every single day because the Israeli soldiers will not stop it from happening. They will participate. Um, there is no protection for Palestinians. There is no protection um, from these types of, of incidents in, in the West Bank. Um, and and the same fear of, of Israeli soldiers coming and doing raids is there. And if you're familiar with um, Beth Salem, uh, for instance, uh, or other Israeli organizations that document human rights abuses, Several soldiers, like Breaking the Silence is another organization, several soldiers have reported that they have been instructed to terrorize Palestinians for no reason other than to cause or incite fear and terror. So they just raid these homes for no reason. So this is the daily lived experience of Palestinians. And this, of course, doesn't even get to the siege on Gaza that... Um, Gazans were experiencing long before October 7th. So <clears throat> what we have then is, is even worse in Gaza because people were trapped, no airport. Um, you know, the, the reports about the nutrition for children and women, maternal um, rates, the um, rates about mental health, but especially among children in Gaza, uh, the fact that water was restricted, the fact that people who were trying to make a living fishing um, were restricted only to go out to a certain point or they would be shot at by Israeli soldiers. So just at the point where in the water, there the, the resources of fish, seafood was plentiful, they weren't allowed to get to that point or they would be shot at. Right? And so that's just a little bit about life in Gaza before October 7th. Um, and, and all of these things are people that I have met testify to because one of the professors that I have worked with and met, Dr. Yusuf Al-Khuri from Bethlehem Bible College, his family's in Gaza. He was born and raised in Gaza. Um, and he lives with his phone. And he said, the reason I live with my phone is because I just want to know how my family's doing. They're in the North. And I, I just want to know how they're doing. And I am terrified to get a phone call, he explained, because I, I never know what that phone call is going to be. So he is one person. How many Palestinians in Palestine in the occupied territories and the diaspora around the globe are living like this by their phones, watching family and friends die, waiting for news? So the... The life for Palestinians before October 7th and beyond October 7th is surviving sheer terror, surviving violence, and and feeling like they do it alone. Um, Dr. Reverend Dr. Munther Isak, his sermons during um, December, the month of December, especially emphasize the fact that Palestinians felt and feel abandoned by the world. And so I think that that also highlighted for me that God wants us to tell the truth, regardless of, um, I, I read a verse in the Quran that said, regardless of whether it's bitter for some people, um, we have to tell the truth because people are paying with their lives before October 7th. And especially now people are paying with their lives because of the lack of truth in the world. And obviously people are invested in the narratives that are not truthful, 
Otherwise, they wouldn't try to silence it. Um, the truth of what Palestinians are experiencing and have been experiencing for over 70 years. Um, and, and I don't want to highlight only the suffering because there is so much more to what it is to be Palestinian. Every person I met was incredibly kind and beautiful, and the economy is faltering so much because the economy never bounced back after COVID. Uh, and then once it even tried to recover, October 7th happened, and so many Palestinians who have the education to be tour guides, for example, are not allowed to cross out of Bethlehem. They're not allowed to leave. And not a lot of tourism is, is going there. So these are the things that sustain that economy. And so people are suffering so much. Aside from all this trauma that I've described, they are suffering economically in every way possible. It is so hard. And yet people are running around trying to just be kind to people. And, and that's um, what came up at the, the conference as well was the concept of sumud, the steadfastness, the nonviolent resistance of the Palestinians to survive occupation every day, to resist every single day. Um, and, and that's incredible. It's, it's the faith of the people. It's the faith of the people that is sustaining them in ways that I don't know that most of us can grasp or comprehend. I think for those of us who live in the U.S., for example, we have the privilege to dialogue with one another and with people. And I think that's necessary because I think what they want is for people to hear their story. And many of us probably know people who are unable to hear the, the story of Palestine. They're unable to hear the truth. Uh, whether because of propaganda, they're not ready to hear the truth, they don't want to know the truth. Um, I think we have the privilege of that. But for them, all of this is about life and death. All of this is about survival. And so we have to do what we can with what privileges we have to speak the truth and to live in discomfort until this situation changes. The genocide and beyond, the, once that stops, whatever that looks like, to continue to speak for an end to the occupation and the ethnic cleansing. Because even as we speak, Palestinians are continuing to be displaced from their homes, from their land, to be detained and not seen for years at a time without any sort of court hearing or anything like that, any sort of due process. Um, and, and Palestinians are shot and killed. Um, I think that's the last thing I'll, I'll share is I visited Ida camp. It's a refugee camp. You can find their website as well. If you've not heard of it, if you uh, go to their website, it tells their story. There are UN, uh, founded ca refugee camp, which again, if people don't know, or if people we try to speak to, uh, try and deny the story of the Nakba displacement of Palestinians, this refugee camp was founded in 1950. It started as tents, Palestinians living in tents when they were displaced from their homes in the 1948 iteration of the Nakba. And then it became buildings because Palestinians built the infrastructure and they were walled in closely into a confined space. So they built upwards and they live in very close quarters in this refugee camp. Life is very hard. Uh, there are two pretty close, one is right next to it and one is pretty far, uh, towers where <clears throat> Israeli soldiers watch the camp. They surveil it. And in fact, our guide who works with children at the camp is now a grown man, was shot in the face when he was a teenager in the camp, born and raised in this camp. Um, and he has a big scar here on his uh, cheekbone where he was shot by a sniper with a rubber bullet. Mm, they showed us the rubber bullets. And an important thing to remember or to think of whenever we hear of um, Israeli soldiers using um, bullets, rubber bullets, the bullet was cut open and it's a metal inside. So it's bad enough that they would hit with a rubber bullet, but there's metal inside. So his face was 
it's completely broken open here. And I, um, you know, fortunately he recovered and he continues to be in solidarity with his community and with the children in this camp. Um, but the camp is not only full of the pieces, these rubber bullets they say, but with canisters of tear gas, because regularly there'll be raids from soldiers for no reason to raid the camp and throw tear gas. Um, if sometimes people gather or even peaceful protest, tear gas. And those tear gas cans are saved in a gift shop in the camp. And those tear gas cans are made in Pennsylvania, um, USA. So, um, and preceding October 7th, uh, the U.S. has funded Israel um, for, for years since, since the Nakba in 1948. Um, and, and the other thing I think that is a visual to keep in mind is all over this camp are the faces of children. And these children are martyrs. So their faces are put up so they can be seen. Um, and they were killed when they were children. Uh, our guide was a witness to one of the killings of these children. And he said the child was just standing, uh, playing, and was shot. And when the family... Uh, went and got his body. They beat Israeli soldiers to getting it because they tried to take the body uh, for who knows what reasons, uh, maybe to hide what had happened, other things I don't know. But what he said was important is then the family demanded that the UN investigate, the UN asked, and they said it was an accident. It was just an accident. So that too, not a unique experience, not rare. Children shot men, women, children shot for no reason in these refugee camps that have existed uh, for 70 years plus um, and have outdated water containers, um, just horrible. But you know what's incredible is the people that work the camp are teaching gardening and the people have hydroponic gardens on the roofs and they're saying that they want to grow their own food and sustain themselves and not rely on Israel for food. So there are beautiful forms of resistance happening all over uh, Palestine and the occupied territories. Uh, but I lament, and all of us, I'm sure, lament that this is what life is like, um, which just encourages me more that we need to keep speaking the truth seeking the truth, uh, even if it's bitter for other people. And I'll stop there. I'm sorry. I talked a lot and that was a lot. <laughs> it's a lot to take in emotionally, I'm sure, but I'm open to any questions that you all have. And, and you know, thank you for hearing me and the stories of the Palestinians I bring with me back to the U.S. Thank you so much, Crystal. Um, at this point, we will just, in case anyone has any questions,